Hey friends, it is good to be with you today. I'm Ricky James, a senior pastor at First United Methodist Church here in Clinton. And whether you're joining us from home, online, or listening to us at Super Talk FM, we are glad that you're with us today as we wrap up our road trip series. Today, heading to Macedonia. And in fact, what we're going to see on this trip is that the journey takes us sometimes to places we never imagined we'd go. So, I hope you've enjoyed our time as we've journeyed together. We've got one more great trip to go on, and I'm glad that you're with us. Welcome. Stillness filled the heavens On crucifixion day Some say it rained But I don't Would you join me now in affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, thank you for your generosity. And as we kind of wrap up the summer, we have so much great things planned for the fall. And your generosity makes all of it happen. And so just want to encourage you to keep up the good work and give. Remember, you can do that in several different ways. You can give safely and securely online right now at firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. Mail your check to 100 Mount Salos Road here in Clinton or drop your check off the next time you're in the neighborhood. We'd love to see you anyway. Come on by. However you choose to give, thank you. And remember, it makes an eternal difference. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're joining us today. I'm Miss Nikki, and we're going to have a few moments for the kids. I brought a map with me this morning. This map actually shows all the different paths that Paul took for his missionary journeys. Remember last week we learned about Saul and his life-changing transformation with the blinding light from Jesus, and after three days Ananias prayed over him and God healed his eyes so he could see again, and then later his name was changed to Paul? That's the same guy we're talking about today. Saul, or Paul, he's known by both names. But anyway, after he became a believer, Paul and other early Christians traveled all over the region to tell thousands of people about Jesus and God's love and forgiveness for the whole world. In today's story, Pastor Ricky is going to tell us about a particular trip that he and some of his friends took to Macedonia. But before Paul made any trip, God came to Paul in a vision, just kind of like a dream, and he told him to go to a distant place where people needed to hear about Jesus. So Paul went, and when these people heard about Jesus and how much Jesus loved them, they believed in God and were baptized to show that they were a child of God. Now, Paul didn't go there because Paul thought it was a good idea. Paul and his friends went because God led them there, and he told them to go. God was like Paul's personal map, or guide. But Paul wasn't on his own, but he had God with him and with all of his friends, too. God makes sure that we always have people with us so that we're not alone. And wherever we go, we can share God's love and not worry, because God will guide us. Well, this week, I want you to think of some different ways that you can share God's love at school, on the playground, at sports practice, and any other places you can think of, okay? Let's pray together. Dear God, you guide us every day throughout our whole lives. We know you are with us even when we don't realize it. Thank you for always being with us and help us tell everyone we meet about you and your love. Amen. Would you join me now in praying to our Lord using the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we reach the end of our road trip journey, uh, thought about how a lot of my road trips ended growing up. And unfortunately, a lot of times it was uh, an argument because we were sick of each other. <laughs> my sister was on my side of the car or she had taken my snacks and eaten them or something, you know. And we got the sense at the end of the trip that we were, we were ready to be done with each other <laughs> and we were ready to maybe spend a little less time around each other. Well, I hope that that's not the case with us, that you've enjoyed our road trip together, but maybe you've experienced that phenomenon of ready to be done 
and maybe arguing with your family. Now, the reason I bring that up is not to make light of that, but to let you know, even good Christian people can kind of get tired of each other. And our road trip today really begins with an example of that. And I, I know that a lot of us like to think that church problems didn't exist back in the early days of the church, that everybody in the first century church got along, but this simply wasn't the case. They were human, and they got on each other's nerves as well. And so our story picks up today as we begin a road trip to Macedonia. And before the trip begins, we learn in the book of Acts that Paul, the new great missionary, and a man named Barnabas get into an argument. Barnabas is the man who invited Paul onto his first road trip to be a missionary for the church. After he had given up his ways of persecuting and become a disciple of Jesus, Barnabas invites Paul on his first missionary trip. And things go well for several years until finally Barnabas and Paul get into a disagreement over another disciple named John Mark. And they decide that after being on the road together for a couple of years, it was better if they split up, go their separate ways, love each other, bless each other, but take different paths forward. And so that's where we pick up the story. Paul and Barnabas have left each other, and Paul has this uh, goal, this vision of his life that he wants to go take the gospel to Asia. He wants to head east. Uh, to what we would think of now as India or Pakistan. And he has this vision of taking the gospel east. But that's not what God's plan is for him. And in fact, sometimes God stops us from our plans in order to put us into a new place, maybe even for something better. And so I want to read you what happens next. So that's the context of our story, our road trip through Macedonia. Uh, Paul has split up with Barnabas. They've gotten into a disagreement. Paul wants to go east, wants to go to Asia, but something always gets getting in the way of that plan. And I want to pick up the story in Acts chapter 16, verse 9. If you have your Bible, I'm going to read through it a little bit. Read a little and preach a little. Read a little and preach a little. So go ahead and open that Bible. Acts chapter 16, verse 9 and following. Here's where the story picks up. During the night, Paul had a vision. And there stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a city leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. So, if you're not up on your geography, uh, what's happening here is uh, Paul has had a vision. He's wanted to go east to Asia, and he's wanted to take the, um, the gospel, but he's called instead to head in a new direction. And he has this vision in the night, a dream, of a man from Macedonia, what we would think of as Greece, saying, come over and help us. Bring the gospel to us. And so they get up the next day, and Paul says, I've had a vision from the Lord. We need to go to Macedonia. And so they set off on this road trip. They set sail, they cross the sea, and, and they enter to this area of Macedonia. And they go to the biggest city closest to them, a city called Philippi. And I want to tell you a little bit about the city of Philippi here in Macedonia. The city was founded by Philip II of Macedon, hence the name Philippi. And Philip of Macedon was the, the father of Alexander the Great, the great uh, Macedonian conqueror who, in his lifetime, conquered the whole world. 
And so from the very beginning, Philippi kind of had a, a military kind of um, uh, quality about its city. And in fact, in the year 44 B.C., years before Paul, in the year 44 B.C., the city of Philippi was the site of the final battle between Mark Antony and Brutus, the leader of the movement that assassinated Julius Caesar. This civil war that had erupted in the Roman Empire following Caesar's assassination uh, culminated in this decisive battle in which uh, the forces of the new emperor, Octavius Augustus, defeated Brutus and the rest of his compatriots. So this ended the civil war, established a new emperor in Augustus, and in reward for uh, the soldiers who had fought with the emperor, uh, in reward for their loyalty and their victory, this city, the site of this battle, was placed aside as kind of a a veteran's retirement home. <laughs> so all of these people who had fought in the battle were given a little bit of land and they settled in Philippi as a thank you, a reward for their loyalty to the new emperor. And so Philippi really became kind of a, a mini Rome. In fact, a lot of the, the town was rebuilt to look like Rome. The architecture, the street layout, and you can imagine with a lot of Roman soldiers retiring there that it, it kind of felt like Rome. And it became a site in which a lot of people would, would retire there who had served their years in loyalty to the empire. It's kind of like if one of our famous battlefields like Gettysburg or Normandy Beach, if it had become a retirement home for uh, soldiers and veterans. So you can imagine that the people who lived in Philippi, very loyal to the empire, very loyal to the emperor, very Roman, very pagan. Which is interesting then, that a hundred years after this battle, it's Philippi in Macedonia that becomes the site that God sends Paul on this road trip to bring the gospel to establish a Christian community in one of the most Roman cities on the continent. Then listen to what happens next on verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. All right, so let me just kind of explain what's happening here. Paul and his uh, associates have crossed over into Macedonia, come to the city of Philippi. And Paul had a particular kind of um, plan of evangelism that he would do when he would come into a new city. He and Barnabas had kind of worked this out. Uh, they would tour the city. They would get a sense of the community, kind of what was important to the community. They would understand or try to understand the community values. And then after a tour of the city, they would go to the synagogue because most every major town in the whole Roman Empire had a synagogue. Uh, and they would go to the synagogue. Often Paul would be invited to preach because he was a visiting rabbi uh, until they found out that he was a follower of Jesus, and then he would get kicked out <laughs> of the synagogue. But typically then, people who would have heard his message in the synagogue would follow him out, and he would teach them more about Jesus. And that was kind of his kind of evangelistic plan, his own kind of Billy Graham crusade model, right? Go tour the city, go to the synagogue, get kicked out of the synagogue, and then share the gospel with those who followed him out. However, when he gets to Philippi, he notices that there's not a synagogue in Philippi. 
Now remember, this is a heavily Roman town, a lot of military veterans, a lot of soldiers who had given their life for the empire. So it makes sense that there's not a large Jewish community. But the fact that there's not a synagogue means that there are less than 10 Jewish men in the whole town. Because it takes 10 Jewish men to make a synagogue. And if there's anyone, any less than 10, you can't have a synagogue. In a city that's probably two or 3,000 people at this point, less than 10 Jewish men. And so no synagogue. But if there wasn't a synagogue, the Torah said that you could go by the river and pray there. And so that's exactly what's happening. Paul goes in, tours the town, sees there's no synagogue, and so he says, well, let's go down to the river. It's the Sabbath day. If there are any Jewish people, they'll be there at the river praying. That's what the law demands. Well, when they go, they don't find any Jewish men or Jewish women. They do find a woman named Lydia, who is a God-fearer, meaning she's praying to Yahweh. That's got to be really interesting. She's Gentile. She's not Jewish. And Paul and his men show up expecting to find this small little group of Jewish people praying. And instead, they hear these Gentiles singing the Psalms and praying to Yahweh. And Paul is, is amazed by this. But then he takes this opportunity to preach to a Gentile about the Messiah of the Jewish people. To preach to a woman, not a group of Jewish men in a synagogue, but to a woman and her friends beside the river there. This is a momentous occasion in the life of the early church. Because look at what happens next. In verse 15. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The reason why I wanted you to see this is because what you probably haven't realized, unless you're a really great geography student, and it's okay if you're not, when Paul left and crossed the sea into Macedonia, he entered a new continent. He came to Europe, a completely different continent than where he had been. In Lydia, Lydia becomes the first Christian baptized on the continent of Europe. Isn't that amazing? What we see here on this road trip is the gospel spreading from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria uh, to uh, the rest of what we think of as the Holy Land, now spreading to Europe, a brand new continent, a whole new world. And Lydia becomes the first baptized Christian on the European continent. And then she invites Paul to come to her house. And what's going to happen over the next few verses and chapters is Lydia, who is a wealthy businesswoman, a dealer in fine purple cloths, which means she's got a good bit of money, she runs her own business, she sets up her house as a church. And people all throughout Philippi and all throughout Macedonia come to Lydia's house to hear the gospel. Her house becomes the first church on the continent of Europe. A Gentile woman opens her home and changes the trajectory of Paul's life, his ministry, and changes the trajectory of the church itself. Isn't that amazing? Because Paul was willing to, to let God lead him on a road trip. Even if he had just gotten into this big argument with his friend Barnabas, you can imagine if he was just tired of being on the road and didn't want to do it anymore, wanted to go back to Tarsus and take up his old job of making tents and just, you know, going to church, going to work, and that was it. But no, he was willing Willing to allow God to, to redirect him. Willing to trust God 
on this journey of faith and life. And then there's Lydia, willing to open herself to the gospel message of Jesus, willing to be baptized and to and to commit her life to Jesus, and then being willing to open her home so that others would experience Jesus through her hospitality. She becomes the first European convert to Christianity, a Gentile convert to Christianity, a woman leading her church and her home, bringing others to Christianity and to faith in Jesus. Those of us who can trace our lineage, our heritage, back to Europe, we're here because of Lydia, because of Paul, because those two people were willing to listen to the Spirit's leading. One, to preach the gospel. One, to provide a place that others might hear. You know, it won't be a few years later after these events that, that in fact, Europe will become the center of the Christian world. Rome will become the epicenter of the faith. It's where Peter and Paul will give their lives because of Jesus. And to think it all started because Paul and Lydia said yes. Paul is often called the greatest missionary of Christianity, and I think he is. But Lydia deserves a lot of credit as well. And in your life, as we have journeyed together in these weeks of road tripping, going to places like Emmaus and Gaza, Damascus, and now Macedonia. I hope you've heard God's call on your own life. Now, God may not be calling you to drop everything and travel to Europe, although that'd be nice, wouldn't it be? <laughs> but maybe He is calling you to a new level of love and service to Him. Maybe it's simply to open your home. Maybe to open your heart. Maybe to just understand that we all have the opportunity to make space for God in our own life, but also to be a, a person to help others connect to Jesus as well. So perhaps the Holy Spirit is preparing even now, this very week, to do something wonderful through your life. Perhaps it's not a moment of great preaching or teaching. Maybe you're not being called to be Paul. But maybe you are called to be a Lydia through faithfulness and prayer, through invitation and hospitality to a friend, co-worker, a family member. Just providing a space to welcome an unexpected guest who will change the direction not only of your life, but countless others. So, as we finish our road trip together, as we end this summer time and begin to get back to business as usual, whatever that will look like, I hope that you've taken time during our trips together to listen a little bit, to maybe talk to God a little bit more, maybe to allow God's dreams to become your own. Because here's the thing. Even though the summer is ending, the journey isn't. Our trip with Jesus continues. And it'll have good days and bad, ups and downs, days where we travel a little bit farther than the other days. Sometimes we have to double back and retrace our steps and get back in line. But the journey is a journey of faith and life. And it lasts as long as our life does. But the road is a road that leads back home. 
And when we get there, God will be pleased, not how long it took us, but how much we grew together on the journey and how much space we provided for others to jump in with us and come along for the ride. So friends, I hope you don't forget what we've learned together as we've gone to these various places. And remember, the good news is, no matter how long it takes or how bumpy the road, the journey is worth it. For the destination is life with Jesus forever. Thanks for journeying with us, friends. And don't remember, don't forget, <laughs> we continue next week because the journey never ends because Jesus calls us home. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for taking this journey with us. I hope you've learned a little bit about our various places we've been journeying to. hope you've learned a little bit about yourself, but more importantly, I hope you know that as you journey forth this week and the rest of your life, Jesus goes with you. And that is good news. Amen.